That countdown always gives me anxiety. I know that we don't have to talk as soon as the recording starts, but still, just seeing a countdown, I'm like panicking in my head. It's like SpongeBob. Yeah, no, a, a good countdown can make you like you can just be out out and about, and if you see a bunch of people counting down, you're like, "What's going on? Something big's yeah. happening." <laughs> shot clock's running out. Got to get a shot up. Yeah, shot clock. New Year's, like a, a nuclear test. Microwave. Uh, Los Alamos. <laughs> yeah. Microwave. <laughs> when Oppenheimer tells uh, his boy that he's got the perfect place for the test site and it fades to black and he's just like, Los Alamos. <laughs> Nolan is the fucking goat. He's such Not a yet. nerd. <laughs> that movie's so good, man. All right, yeah, no, we're back for our Oppenheimer Revisited. Just kidding. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Ruben, formerly known as Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, and we are here to review Civil War, the new film from Alex Gar- Garland. Sorry, I tripped up on his name there because I was pulling up the Wikipedia. Civil War, I w- uh, Googled it, brought me to the actual <laughs> Civil War, so yeah. I have to get to the movie that he directed. Um, so this is his fourth movie. And depending on who you ask, Alex Garland is either one of the best directors working today or an uninspired hack. So it's going to be fun to see people scream at each other over this movie. It's uh, very American of us. And really, the whole world gets to chime in. So that's fun. Yeah, my VPN's in France. So when I Google Civil War, I get the French. Oh, you get French shit? (laughs) They were a while. The guillotine, I was always pro-guillotine. So it's fun uh, reading about how they dealt with their problems. Yeah, no, uh, the January 6th rioters tried to bring the guillotine back. That was crazy. I mean, the January 6th hostages, sorry. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, let's get right into it, right? Starting off contentious. (laughs) Stirring the pot a little bit here. Civil War. Hold on. Um, Move my lightsaber. I've been practicing. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I'm getting nasty. I'm I'm about to be a problem with this thing. That's fun. That's a fun. It's like being able to dance. You know, you just whip out the lightsaber, start doing tricks. Yeah, I don't start think twirling you, it. I don't think you believe me. I'm getting, I'm getting really good. <laughs> I, I don't believe you. I need to see it. <laughs> I'll show you that. I'll make a, I'll make a YouTube tutorial <laughs> how to fight. Oh, with that a could lightsaber. be fun. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. If you ever blow up into a famous person, they'll be like, "Oh, look at these YouTube fight tutorials he used to make. He's just like us, like yeah. Chalamet with his uh, bedazzled Xbox controllers." You ever see uh, those videos? Yeah, it bothers me that you don't believe me, so I'm gonna have to show you wrong. I'm about to bust well, now down I'm your fucking. Gonna... Yeah, I'm about to bust down your fucking door. I know. Yeah, I'm gonna avoid you at all costs. Like Vader at the end of Rogue One. Yeah. So as I said, this uh, movie critics seem to really like it, but it's got people talking. And uh, going into it, I really didn't know what to expect. Obviously, I, I read some reviews, so I figured it was going to be a very intense experience. I didn't expect to feel that much of adrenaline rush at certain parts of the movie. You know, I anticipated that the Jesse Plemons scene was going to be the best scene of the movie, and it was. But there are other moments that are just absolutely berating the senses with imagery and sound and the performances. It's it's all creating these moments that make you feel like you could die at any moment. And uh, that's something that sometimes is lost for me in war movies. Perfect example, a quiet on the all quiet on the Western Front, the new one, which a lot of people really loved. But I became numb to it because it was just nonstop misery. That's what war is. But I, I've seen it in so many movies at this point. Um, but this one really just got under my skin. Where not only was I, you know, just amazed by what I was watching, but I was, like I said, I was legit terrified for not the characters, for my own life. I'm like, am I am I in this right now? Like, am I okay? Well, there's a, I think there's a scene that perfectly encapsulates that. It's, um, I don't know if we want to get into spoilers yet, but there's a moment where a character says, they've never been so scared before, but I never felt so alive. And I think he does a terrific job of capturing that uh, aspect of war where like, yes, we've seen many, many times just the how horrible it could be and the depictions on film of, like you said, like an all quiet on the Western Front where it's just absolute misery all the time. But here there's yes it is very like you said frightening at times but there's it's exhilarating as well like you get you get kind of a rush right yeah and it's not only the large scale battles but it was those small skirmishes 
it's cliche to say, but they put you in the action because you can really, you know, a group of five or six battling for territory in a, in a small spot because they're just so personal. You know, it's just you and that other side. It's not like you have an army backing you up. There's one needle drop in the scene that I'm referencing where it's just it totally doesn't match what's going on. But for me, it was perfect because I love those moments where what you're seeing on screen uh, is terrifying. And the music is energetic and a little cool because it was a uh, De La Soul needle yeah. drop. And I thought some of the images during that sequence, it just all worked. And it, that's a moment that for a lot of people felt awkward. But that awkwardness is what really put a cherry on top of that whole sequence for me. Yeah. And the movie looks incredible, too. I think Alex Garland, even going back to like, I think... It- Annihilation is probably one of his best looking movies, but I think this one's right up there as far as just beautiful shots, like taking advantage of the IMAX format. Like it just, like you said, all that mixed in with some of those needle drops just made for like really great uh, scenes and very artful scenes. But yeah, I think it it is interesting seeing the reactions to this movie because I think you can, uh, we were even on our ride home, like we were kind of, we weren't arguing, but like we were just tossing out ideas and stuff like that. And it's a movie that I think you can take away a lot of ideas depending on how you look at it, or you can say it has no ideas or, or very surface level. And it's interesting seeing the different reactions that people are leaving with. Yeah. Cause I think people, I mean, the title, the marketing, the movie for some people, it feels like it's falling in the trap of fantasy fulfillment because people love the idea of what if a civil war broke out in America? They don't necessarily want to see the lead up, the politics, the boring stuff. They want to see that violent end. So I was wondering how much is the civil war aesthetic and backdrop? How much heavy lifting is that doing versus the story that he's actually telling, which is way more focused on adrenaline junkies chasing that rush, chasing that high, the power of the camera, how that relates to photojournalism and obviously war journalism. So I think a lot of people are making that point that it's hard to say that it's not a political movie when it's dealing with an American civil war. But the true movie is about this crew, these adrenaline junkies. It's a very. Go ahead. I was going to say it's just a very like interesting backdrop for the actual story that's being told. And I think that's what a lot of people are maybe not confused about or or maybe weren't expect maybe weren't expecting going into it and maybe wanted something else. But when you view it as the story and we'll get into it too, but the main focus being on the journalists and kind of what they're willing to do in order to get their shot or their story or do what they feel is right. like it's the focus is more so on that than the Uh, fictional politics that led to this civil war because the movie is very vague in a lot of aspects surrounding the actual conflict that's going on right yeah and this idea to be it's like the race to berlin they even say that in the movie to be the first journalist there who snaps the the shot of this final battle of this civil war and i guess at this point we are getting into spoilers you know this idea that they're going to drag the president into the street like we've seen in other countries and execute him because that's what happens in civil wars that's what happens in revolutions so it's it's more so about their own careers and uh, how they can be a part of history leaving their own legacy by taking that final shot and how it consumes them and it's more than that it is the high the adrenaline the mania and that's something that I hate to do this, but I wish he would have tapped more into that. There's an absurdity with tragedy, of course, we all know that. But this whole premise is very absurd with the backdrop, with the fake civil war, with all these crazy moments. Tap into that mania, tap into that absurdity a bit more. Because some of my favorite moments of the movie is when uh, the character Joel, who's played by Wagner Mora, when he has that high after one of those high octane moments, I was like, this guy's out of his fucking mind. (laughs) When he sees the missiles being shot and he's like, this is giving me a hard on. I'm like, yo, this guy's fucking insane. And obviously you can discuss the ethics of that. You know, what's the, you know, the real purpose here. But to me, that was some of the more interesting character stuff that the movie got into. Well, you can look at it in two different ways. I think you can look at this as a movie where you could tell the same story without this fictitious civil war backdrop. Yeah, because it reminded me a lot of Children of Men, similar road trip, you know, having to get to a destination, all these forces around you. So you can be like, oh, maybe it's unnecessary. Maybe it's bait and switch. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that, which I don't think it is. Or you can look at it as just like, I I think it enhances that story because it is such a surreal thing to imagine, especially, you know, being American, a war of this magnitude on our soil and having 
well, in like the modern era, obviously it's happened before, but, and like you said, like the, the scenes when they're storming DC were like, so like, so eerie, <laughs> like just seeing that happen to that magnitude in like our country where you have the president bunkered in, in the white house and, you know, Amer- American soldiers coming in to try to try to kill him. Like it was just a absurd thing to kind of wrap my head around while watching it. And I think that added to the anxiety of it, of it all. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the criticism there, and I don't necessarily think this is true, is that we're bringing so much social anxiety because of the state of our country that seeing those images scare us even more because of the point that we're at. So people could argue, and I'm not arguing this, but I've seen people argue it, that it's sort of exploiting those fears that we have about the state of our country. But I think what makes up for that is the fact that it's shot expertly because he really has a handle on how to direct a movie and how to direct uh, direct an action sequence and even the smaller character moments. And then goes to the performances being led by Kirsten Dunst, who was, I thought, just perfect casting because she's got that world weary look to her as a photojournalist and Stephen McKinley Henderson being the old veteran taking care of the kids. He's like their dad and the young character who is just getting into photojournalism, Kaylee um Spain Spainy yeah yeah she was great too so you have all these you know the the generational uh perspectives on photojournalism how it's changed how it's evolved what their job what their role actually is in society so all that stuff worked so well for me that just because he was playing on my own anxieties and fears it didn't really take me out of it or it didn't upset me so much where the aesthetic in the backdrop is rubbing me the wrong way artistically politically i think that's a totally different conversation even with oppenheimer i had issues with some of its politics but it was the best movie of the year for me so right. or second best after john wick and like kind of what we were talking about after the movie it's like uh, the way some of the things you took away from it because like like i said before it was very vague and like, we really don't know why this was happening, but you know, you did some reading between the lines when they talk about dismantling the FBI. So maybe consolidating power was probably the main issue there with that president. But um, you don't, you don't really know why this is all happening. Who are we rooting for? Who, who, like who, like in some of those skirmishes, you're like, who's the Western forces? Who's Flor- is it the Florida Alliance? Is it uh, American soldiers? You don't really know. So you kind of have to, plug your own little plug your own beliefs and thoughts into what's going on to kind of make the movie whole for you uh, for you i guess um yeah no i think that's what he's banking on and one of my friends uh josh made a great point he was like i'm excited to see both sides of the aisle take away what they want to and then point the finger at the other side and say see they're criticizing you crazies over there because he's kind of using these buzzwords where once again, he's hinting at a president who's consolidating power. To me, that feels like Trump. But he's also talking about the Antifa massacre, where Antifa is not an armed resistance group in this country. But people hear that and they think, oh, yeah, Antifa, they're the ones who destroyed America a few years ago. So he's playing off of these buzzwords. He's like pushing buttons depending on where you stand. And uh, as my friend Uh, the point that he made, shout out to Josh, is that it's going to be fun to sit back and see people throw shit at each other, even though he's clearly not taking a stance. And I think that that is frustrating in the sense of, you know, you're making a a movie about armed conflict in America. And I think that there are ways that you could more explicitly relate that to what we're experiencing now without it being, you know, actual names and people and stuff like that. You know, you could keep it Nick Offerman. I actually think that's really funny. The idea that Ron Swanson became president and tried to crown himself King. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, and I think that's, he doesn't seem like a political person and even with his interviews. So I can understand why people are like, oh, you're just sort of exploiting this idea. But my problem- It's not like um, like an Oliver Stone where he, you know, he's the man's obsessed with politics. And just because you're not obsessed with politics doesn't mean you can't make a movie like this. But my problem with that is, number one, like we said, the main focus is on like, obviously that's all that would add to the backdrop and everything that's going on. But I think the main focus is on these characters that are photographers more so than any political statement he's trying to make. And two- like people trying to interject what they, or because it is an American civil war and all the division that we've had in this country, I think people wanted it to be 
uh, have something to say towards current um, American politics and relate to that when this is just a completely fictitious uh, set of circumstances that have led to the skirmish, uh, the war in this movie. It's almost like you wanted to say something about the current events and you wanted it to align with what you think about it as well. And it didn't give you that. So now it's apolitical and has nothing to say, which I don't truly buy into. Right. Yeah. And I think that, like I said, tapping into some of the mania, a movie that I kept going back to while watching it was was, uh, Southland Tales. So I think tapping into some of the mania would have benefited if you were, you know, going that route of making an actual political commentary on the world. And it's a completely different movie, though. But I think that's it's interesting to just talk about, maybe not for a review, because it is it is taking away from the actual movie we got. Yeah. Um, But I I did. uh, There was the vagueness at first. uh, I don't I don't want to say it bothered me, but I was kind of just waiting for it to all. I thought there's going to be a moment where I'd look back like, oh, now it makes sense now. okay. so in that that first little smaller intimate battle sequence. Now I know what was who was on each side and why they were fighting. So I, I thought it would be one of those things where you, you find out information later on and then you look back with a different uh, set of glasses and it's a little more clear. But we never really got that. Um, and But as the movie went on, I really didn't mind because I kind of liked kind of just being on my toes trying to put the pieces together to try to figure this out, especially with that Jemmy, the Jesse Plemons scene. Like you said, it was the best scene of the movie. You really don't know what side he's on, what he's about, why he's doing any of this, but it's just so fucking frightening. And I think it adds, that's why it's so frightening. Cause you're like, why is you as the, the viewer are like, why are you doing this in the sense of why are you doing this? Like what side are you on? Like who's giving you the orders? What's, what's the mission? Like all this different things, but also on a human level, like why are you doing this to other humans in such a, m- a malicious psychopathic way? Right. Yeah. And that was a moment where a scene that I really liked, and I, I actually really enjoyed the politics of that scene because it, it looks like they were just a rogue militia. That right. was taking matters into their own hands, you know, capitalizing on the chaos to further their ideology that you need to be born in America in order to be American. Uh, essentially, a rogue white, uh, essentially just a rogue white nationalist militia, and I, I think that's where the vagueness really adds to the tension of that scene because you put the pieces together; they don't explicitly tell you what they're doing, but you realize that within in the midst of the chaos that groups like this could wreak havoc and could wreak terror on civilian populations. And uh, the imagery of the the mass grave was horrifying. And Jesse Plemons may be the best actor at playing somebody who's totally dead inside. And it speaks to his versatility because he's more than just that as an actor. But when he needs to go... So you could just stop that best actor. (laughs) When he needs to be a stone cold psychopath, there's nobody scarier in the business. Uh, And that's a moment, that's a scene that I'll think about for the rest of my life because it's broad daylight and the cockiness of that man, the way he's aiming the gun and swinging the gun around, the way he's tormenting them uh, psychologically, it's just, uh, it's an absolute beast of a scene. And the fact that we're in spoilers now, Stephen McKinley Henderson coming to save the day got me (laughs) so hype. Like, I'm going to hit you with a fucking truck, motherfucker. Dude, I love... I love that he like it's like he basically brought his like Deb's crew. I, I love directors. Oh yeah, that. he's got his crew now. Yeah, yeah. I kept thinking like uh, I loved Kirsten Dunst in this, but I bet Natalie Portman was like, "Oh, I could have done that. I could have played the lead." Well, I'm not part of the crew anymore. Or even uh, what's her name from Ex Machina? Right. Yeah, Alicia Vikander. Holy oh, shit, yeah. where's she been? But it seems like he roll, he's rolling with uh, well, Kaylee Spaney, Spaney was in Deb's. Nick Offerman. Stephen McKinley Henderson, Celia Mizuno, she's uh, returning. Small role, but um, yeah, I like directors that have just their their crew of actors that they roll with. And I just have to give Stephen McKinley Henderson his flowers because he's a guy who's a legend on stage, but for decades he just didn't appear in Hollywood movies. So it almost feels like he should be bigger than he is because he truly is one of our greatest actors, not just working today, but of all time. And in every movie you see him in, when he's got these little bit parts and he's got a bit more to do here than in other movies that he's previously been in, he just absolutely eats it up. Like I said, playing that fatherly role, uh, giving them tough love. He is just, uh, he would be my casting. If we did like American Harry Potter, he would be Dumbledore. I think he's got (laughs) that sort of stature. 
Yeah, I, mean, I just love him. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, never like big, big roles, but like when you look at his filmography, like Dune, Lady Bird, Manchester by the Sea, Lincoln, Fences, Civil War. And you could just, afraid. you know, when they talk about the purists uh, acting on stage is always going to be superior to film, you kind of see it in some of these guys who spent their careers on stage. You're like, yo, this guy just, this is second nature to him. Like he just eats up every line of dialogue. Um, and I'm trying to think of another actor like that. There was there was one that came to mind uh in this very movie? recently. No, in another movie I saw where they you know, they're famous for the stage and then they make that transition to uh to the screen and you just see it. It's like, yeah, no, these motherfuckers are Lin Manuel are next level. <laughs> yeah, Lin Manuel, exactly. <laughs> I was watching uh what was he in? I can't I can't even tell you a movie he was in recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sopranos. <laughs> he was in Sopranos. <laughs> um <laughs> No, and all the performances, dude, were, um, that was the best part. Like, I didn't expect to like these characters as much as I did. And I also think that there was a hint of, obviously, they're in a war-torn country and they're putting their lives on the line. But this idea that they're doing it for their own pleasure and their own gain, it almost speaks to the privilege of being a war photographer during an American Civil War versus being a war photographer in a place where you know, your hometown, your entire culture is being wiped out and you have to bear witness to it. You know, not only are you doing a job, but you're experiencing that loss as well. Because when you, these characters would talk about their family, they'd be like, oh, my dad's back in Missouri on his farm pretending that it's not happening. Oh, same thing. My family's back in Colorado. They're all safe and sound. So it's gotten to a point where they've become so disillusioned, uh, which is something that uh, I think we could also argue about this idea that journalism isn't making that sort of impact that it used to. But this idea that they're like I said, they're disillusioned and they're just doing it for the thrills to me was a fascinating idea because it makes the characters less likable, especially at the end, you know, go jumping into spoilers. What Jesse does to Lee, she, she got her killed. Yeah. She straight then, up got her killed trying to get that shot. But even like they did that. And that's no that's remorse. The, that's the job. Like that's kind of what you take from it. Even her, you know, her partner that she's been with for all these years that have this relationship, Joel just picks her up. It's like, yo, let's go get the shot. Like it's yeah. just, but I felt, I, you know, I felt bad for Lee because she deletes the shot of, uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson. And then Jesse snapped her like, say cheese, motherfucker. No, it was <laughs> say a great, cheese and get off of me. It was a great, um, callback to earlier when Jesse asked her, if she dies, will you, will you, uh, take a picture of it or will you yeah. capture it? Some of the scenes like, even when she takes a picture of after the bombing and the opening, well, one of the earlier sequences in the movie, she takes the picture of her taking the picture of the dead bodies. That's an awesome parallel to, I forget the real photo it was, you know, this big photo, I think it won an award or whatever, but there's a picture of some the person taking that picture and it just adds such a different context to what's going on um, right. that these... I don't want to say it's like it's not a moral wrong, I don't think, but it's just something about seeing somebody capitalizing off of that death, even though they are capturing it for the greater good to tell that story. It just it's just there's just something that doesn't sit right when you see that, I feel like. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely an ethical debate to be had there. And the movie is sort of having it. And that's why I think it sends Jesse to this place of maybe she won't be able to forgive herself down the line. Even well, though you what, got this iconic shot, but one of your heroes just died in front of you and you could care less. But that's what Lee says. Like she alludes to photography as being, she doesn't write, she's not telling the story. She's putting it out there for other people to debate it or politicize it or whatnot. But for her, she's just capturing reality. Um, and that's almost uh, the way they film some of those moments where they're on the battlefield and they're just they're almost like flies on the wall. <laughs> it's, um, it's a really interesting thing to witness. And also the way he incorporated the black and white still images in between the action when something crazy would happen and it would just camera would flash, take that picture. And you would see those moments though, that, that one frame of somebody being shot through the neck right mm -hmm. after they were pleading for their life. All of that was just those, those moments just uh, took your breath away. It's like, yeah, it's real time documentarians, but like the way the access they have, the kind of normalcy it is like, it's, it just seems like everyone knows what they're there for. Like to me, it was the most absurd thing I've ever seen. I'm like, what, why are they allowed to be there? 
right. why are they why are they sneaking up with them and they're like helping them and like they they're interacting and they know the deal and i i had no idea it's like actually like that uh, yeah the you access think that, uh... they're granted and um you kind of got a sense too at the end with the western forces when they finally break through to the white house like they wanted them there to kind of document their heroics <laughs> Or right. Yeah. They wanted to. They wanted to capitalize off of being the ones that actually did it. So there's so yeah, many. I think that final frame was so funny, dude. When they're smiling over his body. Yeah, and that's why I think that's what the movie has more to say about than just our contemporary politics. It's more on, um, or the larger, you know, more, I guess, obvious things to tackle. But I think these are the things that I'm interested in, and I think I find very interesting. Yeah, I think that he could have just left out. Because this is a growing idea that uh, I really just don't like in politics, that both sides are just crazy and the proper position is right in the middle. I saw people commending him for not taking a position. I kept seeing that all over, that he was so brave for not giving his thoughts on something. And my only point to that is at any moment in history where things changed for the better. It was never because of somebody who was standing in the goddamn middle. So I just hate this idea that it's so profound to not take a position because that, that is. inherently is taking a position. So I didn't like the, the, the couple of lines of, you know, both sides are just crazy. War is war. We don't even know why we're killing each other. I think that is a bit simplistic. And I think it feeds into this American anti-intellectualism where there's such a reluctance to confront the true problems in this country because of how we as individuals may be complicit. So we'd rather just chalk it up to, oh, both sides are crazy and they, they don't even know what they're they're angry about. Well, I know what I'm upset about. And as I said previously, uh, any moment in history of consequence, normally those people are considered radicals, the ones who wanted to push forward with progressive change. And then when we look back on them, they're called modern. So I just don't like this growing sentiment that things have just gotten so out of control and, and so crazy because I think it's just a an unwillingness to confront the truth. And that's something that keeps growing in our culture and our society. So I think there's but that doesn't take away from the whole movie for me. You know, those are just some lines. And I think that his politics are a little naive. And I think that's just a, a lot of people. It's the I, emoji, the crazy one. <laughs> yeah, right. Like these people are crazy. Yeah. You know, it'd be is, like it, watching a, an adult saying, I'm going to beat the shit out of that kid. And then the kid's all hysterical. Like this adult's going to beat the shit out of me. And then here's me in the middle. Like, man, both sides are fucking crazy. <laughs> You guys are out of control. The, the I'm thinking about it now, like the Civil War backdrop. I think it allows a couple things. Um, if you want to tell this photographer story, um, if it's a foreign invader coming, if you want to keep the, you know, DC is falling and like that kind of vibe to it, a foreign invader. I feel like you couldn't really. It wouldn't make sense for these photographers to be granted that access or document it in the same way if it was like say. I don't know, Germany or Russia coming in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somehow Germany is returned or like a, like a foreign, a foreign invader. Uh, yeah. I, I think that becomes a completely different movie. And if it's the opposite where we're going, you know, to a foreign country and we're bringing down their government government and we have the photographers on our side documenting it, that's a totally different movie as well. Cause now you're documenting, you could, you know, it's a whole other discussion we're having of like exploiting the deaths of foreign citizens for, you know, whatever way you want to frame our uh, America conquering a different country. So uh, keeping it home, although it does spur on these other debates and obviously connections to our real world, I think it fully allows to tell this story of these American journalists documenting this event in a weird way. Because, oh, yeah, like, yeah. It just becomes completely different movies if you try to mess around with uh, what type of war or who, what war, who's winning, what side, where is it. Keeping it home, I think, kind of allows this to all manifest itself in the best way possible when it comes to these characters. Um, and yeah, like you said, just that the ending, the way it's shot, the anxiety it induces, um, just the scenery. I mean, them bombing the Lincoln Memorial. And invading the White House. Oh, yeah, dude. It was just to see. I was just in D.C., so I was like, yo, that's crazy, man. <laughs> They're sieging the city. Yeah. 
and especially with modern warfare, it's so it's fucking scary. Uh, I I don't know how everything just like it, it's just so different when you're watching. Like if this was was a 1800 Civil War movie, it makes more sense to you know watch that kind of battle where it's just like okay, a bunch of people on this side, a bunch of people on this side on a field, and they meet and fight. There's just so much going on nowadays with all the weaponry and technology that it's just it's fucking insane just a level of destruction that can happen in in the snap of a finger yeah the one last point i want to make here is uh i wish he would have leaned into the mania a bit more the hysteria and uh i loved when the characters were having the time of their lives those were some of my favorite moments you know one of the best scenes just to hammer home how much of a adrenaline junkies these motherfuckers are was when they're going back and forth through the car windows. Yeah. You know, she sees oh, that, yeah. that man and she's like, yeah, I want to fucking do that shit too. So, uh, I love that. Those moments of just pure elation from these near death experiences. And it's so true, dude. Like the other day I almost got hit by a truck and for the <laughs> rest of the day, my senses were heightened. I felt so alive. Because you just you have that near death experience and you're like, whoa, I I could have lost this. And uh, as I said, everything just becomes a bit more heightened. Dude, this movie like convinced me to want to go skydiving or some shit. I was like, I need an adrenaline. I would have a fucking heart attack when they're running (laughs) from like barricade to barricade and like slowly making their way towards the White House. Oh, man, I was like, you see it all the time, like the meme where it's like the person leaning in a little. And like, that's something I would be like, I never actually do, but I get what they're saying. I actually leaned in. I'm like, okay, I'm walking (laughs) in right here. Right. And I think the, the idea that the movie's a bit sullen and I think in a, in a different world, it could have been, what would be the opposite of that? More manic. I, I keep using that word where it doesn't have to be as depressing because they seem to be really excited about it, except for Lee. Lee's more so on the fence and especially with Jesse coming along. But this is like a thrill. It was like a rat race, you know? Yeah. Race, race to DC. <laughs> Any last thoughts, Aaron, before we take some fan questions? I think we pretty much sums it up. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I wonder why well, Alex Garland said he doesn't like directing anymore. So well, he's got a new project, right? I, I thought that was uh, dropping this year, too. He's dropping two in a year. Well, I said, like, in an old podcast that I just wanted to give him a bunch of money to see what he can do with it. And I guess this is kind of what that would be, right? He's got a movie called Warfare, and I, I can't remember what the premise was. And he's also a writer for 28 weeks, uh, 28 years later, which I'm really excited about. I think he's, I think he's really good. Um, I think Men was a little mixed, to say the least. Um, but Annihilation and Ex Machina are two of my favorite movies in their respective years. I really like this one too. Devs is another one. I think that great concept, but never really fully realized. And I think when it comes to directing and fully exploring a story, um, exploring some of these ideas, I think he's very good or very underrated. Not someone who's, I want to, I would say a household name, but I would like to see him work more, but he says he's, uh, falling out of love of of filmmaking so that would be a bummer yeah that that really would yeah warfare will poulter cosmo jarvis oh oh shit my fucking boy joseph quinn noah centineo oh my god charles manson melton oh michael gandolfini this doesn't seem real oh that was the report that i just saw that gandolfini was cast in it it just seems like it's something that like loosely tied to the movie I don't think all these people are going to be in it. <laughs> well, Teddy thought this was a spinoff of Leave the World Behind. Civil War? Yeah, he responds to my story. He's like, oh, that's the Leave the World Behind spinoff, right? I'm like, uh, I don't think so. Leave the World Behind was way more offensive in its politics in this movie. Because that movie was straight up like Americans are just dumb and stupid and they're, they're, it's very easy to make them fight each other. That was an offensive movie. Uh, and Obama was actually a co-writer. so. <laughs> Was that movie is just dripped in neoliberal dog shit politics. Um, like that one's trying to really make a point. Whereas Civil War, people are frustrated that maybe it's not. But I think Leave the World Behind was, you can't even compare the two. I mean, you can, but Leave the World Behind sucks. Obama on the <laughs> that pen? Would be my, yeah, Obama was on the pen. I would much rather a movie like this than a movie that tries to say, like, make a point, but they're so bad at it or the point just sucks. <laughs> I haven't seen Leave the World Behind, but 
Um, I think the nothing... boys does a great job of changing it around, but it's clearly based on our world in a way that's so funny and hysterical and, and still hits emotionally. All right, let's take some fan questions. <laughs> Thinking of Obama on the pen now. Oh, I thought you were going to do a bit. <laughs> no, I can't. I don't do a good Obama. <laughs> I don't do good, I don't do good impressions. Can't do a Trump. Can't do an Obama. I'll be an awful SNL cast member. The other day, uh, for some reason, I did a Russian accent. It was perfect, but then I couldn't do it again. <laughs> after. It was just amazing. Like, you know, when you're not thinking of an impression and you do it and it just hits. Yeah. And then you can't repeat it. Uh, this question here from Jack of all trades. Perfect question to open up. Uh, top three A24 movies. That is difficult because they've got a lot of fucking movies at this point. There is a lot. Yeah. Um, there's probably a lot that you don't even know are A24. Oh, yeah. And there's there's quite a few that I haven't even seen because not all of them are great, according to critics. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't watch them. But uh, I, I could have swore Under the Skin was A24. It looks like it's not. But if it is, that's definitely up Might there be for neat. me. Everything, Ex everywhere, Mach. all at once. Yeah, Ex Machina. Yeah. Ex Machina, Zone of Interest, recent one, that's good. Um, Lighthouse. Yeah, Lighthouse. Uncut Gems, holy fuck, this is hard. Past Lives is A24. There's so many good ones. Oh, I got my top three. Uncut Gems, First Cow, and uh, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I'd probably throw to Lighthouse, Ex Machina. Um, Hereditary is A24, too. Lady Bird. I oh, know, so many good ones, dude. Moonlight's so good. Moonlight, yeah. I feel like we don't talk about how good Moonlight is when we think of that year, uh, even though it did win over La La Land. Yeah, no, the story is just permanently the uh, Oscars snafu. No, yeah, but it's just like La La Land is just such a more popular movie. Oh, right, right, yeah. And a movie probably I've seen more than Moonlight, even though I think Moonlight is better. Yeah, people give A24 so much shit, but damn, still, to this day, they make really good movies every year. Like I said, not all of them are good, but people are, uh, just wait until they become, because they're doing something big with Apple, right? If that comes out and it stinks and then they sell out, then we can start no, shit on them. Under the Skin's A24. Oh, it is? Damn, yeah. that might be, might have to, I don't know. I don't know who I'm taking out there. I'm moving on. Uh, this question here from Overnight Doorman. What's your go-to noise in the background when you're doing stuff? Movie or show? Ooh. Um, I don't really like... I'll put on just like cable. Yeah, yeah. Put, just put like on anything. Baseball game or something. Yeah, I do like YouTube first take. <laughs> and just let them roll. A few hours in, I'm watching like the Steelers Cardinal Cardinals Super Bowl. I do That's need white noise you. to sleep though. I really? have to have a, I have to have a fan on or something. I used to be like that in uh, high school. Now I'm no noise. Because luckily, fingers crossed, I'm, I'm just good at falling asleep. I'm the worst. I'm just yeah, that I'll sucks, be, dude. <laughs> I'll just be laying there for hours sometimes. Bring I up that Duolingo. People. I envy people who can just get into bed and just knock out. You should learn Italian on Duolingo just to fuck with Teddy. Because that, that will inspire him to want to learn it. You should just memorize like 10 sentences and just fucking blow his mind. I was watching the Glorious Bastards the other day again. <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Italian always gets me, man. Especially when Landa just starts speaking it fluently. <laughs> See, like, could you imagine Tarantino's Civil War movie? <laughs> He's a fun guy. Every war movie that comes out, I, I appreciate Inglorious Bastards more. Good or bad, like it or not. But I'm just like, he nailed it. It's just such a fun way to do a war movie. And he's got, a, Nolan's got a lot of that in him too. It's like, wait, why don't we just make them superheroes? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. It's movie, it's fiction. We could just make them awesome. Yeah. I love how Brad Pitt's accent is just not a real accent. <laughs> Gorlami. Gorlami. like even when he says uh it's like when you join my team my whatever it's like you take on a debit so i don't think anyone says debit for debt <laughs> <laughs> sound good it's crazy that uh adam sandler was supposed to be the bear jew yeah <laughs> i think he would have nailed it because the bear the bear jew is a great character but eli roth is not a good he's not good in that role um, this question here from B. What up, B? Uh, do you guys think Dune 2 will carry Oscar buzz long enough to get the appropriate amount of nominations? I do. I think so. And yeah. I think the first Dune getting nominated really helps it. And I think it's going to be a slow year for movies in the sense that with all the strikes and everything, I think we're going to hit kind of similar, maybe not as apparent, but like the COVID years where it's like there's just enough of a gap to make it unlike 
previous years. So I think that helps it when it comes to like competition wise. But um, I feel like as time goes on, we've kind of move away toward move away from the idea that a movie coming out early in the year loses momentum and steam. I think with streaming, social media, and kind of everything else that's ingrained in our society now, the the staying power is much more. Uh, I think movies like just have a longer shelf life in general of relevance than they they've had probably maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, I think that is sort of ending because we've had movies come out in these earlier months and I mean everything out really there all well. at once came out yeah. early. Get um, out it was February. Get out. I mean even Oppenheimer was July uh, July? Yeah, no, summer movies have had trouble too uh, remaining relevant until the fall. Barbie July obviously too, so we're kind of moving away from that and I think that's a good thing. Skin of a rink January. Uh <laughs> good question here but I just lost it. Oh, from Photo Fox. What's a movie do for a remake that will never be remade? That's an interesting question because we're always talking about movies that shouldn't be remade. But what's a movie that should be? And I think that sometimes a remake is warranted and you can justify it. Like there's a show, uh, World on a Wire. It's a show I always used to tell you about. And uh, I was like, man, this show would be for today's world, uh, especially now with AI technology and the way that's going to impact the world. So I think that's right for a remake. And the original is amazing. It's uh, very influential on sci-fi movies, uh, specifically The Matrix. So I definitely recommend check- checking it out. Uh, in terms of like Hollywood movies, more recognizable, I'm not sure. Dune. <laughs> that could have been my answer five years ago. What do you think some of these movies will be? Like, you know how like a play, how it's almost like. Yeah, when it turns into, yeah, and like Shakespeare. Nobody says, oh, you're remaking Macbeth. <laughs> Right, right. People love that shit. They're like, yeah, new Macbeth. <laughs> yeah. Like, when does that become a thing? I think eventually. I mean, I think we're we're even starting to see it, but that is a good point because it's like when they do Macbeth, and it's not always great, but if like you're doing it on stage, you have so many opportunities to get it right. Like maybe your first show is not great, but, the, but by the time you're doing it for six weeks, it's like, yeah, this is a really good Macbeth production. Movies are tricky. Because you can remake a classic and there's so many moving parts. So many things have to go right just to make a competent movie, let alone a good one. Because I feel like West Side Story would be like a good candidate for that. Where it's like every 50 years you get this interpretation of West Side Story, but which is an interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. So it's kind of in the same vein of that where it's like familiar story that I want to see their take on it, you know? Right. Yeah. And that, that was kind of like what Feige was saying about the MCU evolving is that Iron Man could become a character like James Bond where multiple people play Iron Man. But even for uh, other franchises, like I think this might be sacrilegious for some people, but bring an Indiana Jones to the modern day where he's just a modern man. It's not set in during World War II. Give him modern day problems. And I think that could be really fun. Obviously, Steven Spielberg, you're not going to match those action sequences, but update it. Instead of trying to fucking drag out 80 year old Harrison Ford running around punching people, let that man rest. Yeah, that that's an interesting idea. Like even The Godfather, right? Like it's become so iconic. If you were to remake it today, there'd be mass hysteria. But if you were making it under the same way that you make remake Shakespeare, or you know, it's like it's such an important story. We would like to tell this for today's audience or give it an update because uh, we respect it so much. And we're not trying to just capitalize on the fact that people know it. It's tricky with film, man, because Hollywood has just become a whorehouse where everybody just wants money. All right, we'll take a few more here. This question uh, from Connor. Do you think that The Acolyte, the new Star Wars show, is deserving of all the hate pushback it's getting? I saw like 10 seconds of that trailer and uh, I just closed my laptop and I think I walked my dog and had a nice evening. It's crazy how little I care about it. Why will that franchise just give us knights of the old republic just give us star wars game of thrones what are you waiting for i'm not even like it's not even like oh i don't care because i'm not trying to be like ooh, i hate what star wars has become or blah 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 it's just i just don't have the interest or the the time to dive into every aspect of a star wars trailer and be like well uh, hmm, less can't happen because <laughs> yeah i know dude the pr- negates the prequels everyone has to die then <laughs> I just don't have the energy for any of it. I'm too busy playing real life Star Wars and getting nasty at this lightsaber, you know? (laughs) My thing with Star Wars is I want two things. Knights of the Old Republic, hard PG-13, whatever that means. 
cool ass costumes, Hollywood stars, dude. A-listers. You know, Christian Bale's the fucking villain. He said he wanted to do Star Wars. Get Christian Bale. Don't waste him. Or episode 10. I would be excited for episode 10 because uh, enough time has passed where if they give me a fucking in theaters Star Wars episode 10, I will be there. Other than that, I just can't get excited about it. A hundred years before the prequels, the Acolyte. It's just like, yo, you you got to have some faith in your audience that they're going to follow along if you if you update some things here. I was rewatching Force Awakens. No, I didn't sit there. It was just on TV. So I was just watching a few scenes. It's just crazy how everything's turned out. And I like <laughs> I like Force Awakens a lot. But even then, like when you look back on it, like it took what a couple weeks of people being like, oh hell yeah, Star Wars is back to like, well, it's just a new hope ripoff. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened so quick. <laughs> and from there on, it's just been ugh. It's wild how uh mild that feels looking back that uh force awakens at the time felt so toxic with daisy ridley's uh ray being called a mary sue and uh all the shit that all the racist bullshit that uh john boyega had to deal with and as i said it almost feels mild compared to what it became (laughs) (laughs) right those were the good days yeah no those were like the (laughs) star wars was back days (laughs) Jesus Christ. If you could tell like somebody walking out of the theater of A Force Awakens, like, buckle up, this is going to be more toxic than the prequels. Like, after that experience, you'd be like, huh? I mean, what? Star Wars is back. I just saw it. I just saw Han and Chewie. <laughs> yeah, I like, uh, what do you mean? I liked it. I enjoyed yeah, myself. They're back in the Falcon. They're, they're getting into a ruckus. But yeah, no, uh, the Acolyte, uh, we'll see. If it comes out and it gets great reviews, I might tap in. Yeah, I mean, if it's good, then good. It's a, it's in, uh, people want it to be bad too that's the thing i never get that oh yeah i'll never understand that either i saw a picture on twitter it was of george lucas i think he was eating lunch but someone like someone captioned it was like ah oh, fuck what it? it was the most ridiculous spin zone i've ever seen basically it was like him selling to disney to show that like basically he did it to exposed disney oh yeah I know. <laughs> it's like just being like i'm like no he did it for four billion dollars <laughs> it was it was very much elon musk mass masterful gambit so. yeah right <laughs> well it's also like um they fail to realize that george has a grudge against disney now because their deal was yeah sell to us and we're going to bring you on as a consultant we're going to we're going to use your ideas according to george lucas he wasn't going to have final say but that he would be way more involved and then once they made the sale they kind of just kicked him to the curb like you know you have your money but this idea that it was you know he wanted to work with disney so that narrative totally falls apart and it is just ridiculous anyway and the, the, you know with kathleen kennedy like uh her legacy is this is Jordan on the Wizards, bro. People don't understand that. Like she's she's a made woman for a long, long time, years before the Force Awakens came out. Oh, yo, her people not realizing like her previous success before this. But also, if I was her, I would have got the fuck out of there. I can't believe she. Yeah, she's just stuck around. Honestly, I respect her. it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I respect it. But like, fuck you, motherfuckers. You, Kathleen Kennedy. Look at all the projects, like. And all your success, like I'll just be like, yo, yeah, I, I can't deal with these fucking people anymore. <laughs> I'm just gonna go do something else. But yeah, actually, yeah, that's kind of baller if you think about it. Yeah, no, it's it's le- legit like Phil Jackson taking over the Knicks. You know, you've got your <laughs> chips. Just walk away, man. But no, uh, she was like, fuck you. I'm getting this money. The yeah. money's good. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this question here. From Angus Monty, Children of Dune miniseries. Children of Dune is the third novel, and uh, I think that could be fun, doing Dune Messiah and then going into, uh, you know, spoilers, the Children of Dune. <laughs> well, there is a series, right? Well, there was a Dune series, I think, previously, but uh, you mean like a new one with the Benny Jesuit? No, Children of Dune series. Like it ha- Oh, like, that is yeah, the series, right? Yeah, in the 90s. Okay. Yeah, that's probably what i'm thinking of yeah it's interesting to see what they do with this after messiah if they keep it in the same continuity with warner brothers obviously villain is probably going to be done after that um what they decide to do yeah that's interesting too right if they keep the continuity and there are all these theories now about what is going to change in messiah 
people are reading into Dune, uh, especially the relationship between Paul and Chani, that he's already changed uh, the trajectory of Messiah for the better, I think, for, for a lot of people. I'm, I think that movie's going to be fucking massive. Yeah, dude, especially that title. People are going to be like, huh? Like, they're going to know, but it's like, what the hell happened? You think they'll do Dune 3? Dune Part 3? No, they can't. They got to call it. You got to do the Dune Messiah. That's too badass. I know, but I feel like they would think Dune 3 would sell better. Yeah. I think there could be a case of... uh, Some people are just not... No, they're not tapped in. They're not locked in. They're not tapped in. Like, Dune Messiah, you know, they could be like, oh, it's just like a spinoff. Obviously, you see the trailer, you see the same characters, but like... I think there's a chance that they can do like Dune Part 3 and then also include Messiah. Or maybe our American title is only Dune Messiah and the rest of the world gets Dune Part 3 or vice versa. (laughs) The rest of the world gets the better title like with uh, Boy and the Heron, the Japanese title. What would it be? Dune Part 3. Messiah? Messiah, yeah. But I'm trying to think of a movie that does that. I was just thinking of it the other day where it switches between... Like the third one's got a, a title, even though the second one was just, oh, that's John Wick. Like John Wick 3 was just John Wick uh, Parabellum. Yeah. And yeah. all the others are just part two, part one, part part four. Chapter five. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter four. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Star Wars. Yeah. It's they like kind of do it. Ep- episode. Episode seven, a new uh, Force Awakens, you know, so it kind of does both. Yeah. I'm sure Warner Brothers, they're, they've got smarter people than us. <laughs> Actually, maybe they don't. <laughs> they're going to call it Arrakis. Because Dune actually never existed. That's just a lie. Um, Okay, guys, that does it for this episode of Nerd Soup. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. I'm sure the comment section is very civil. (laughs) Aaron, I hope you have a good rest of your day. You're going to brunch, right? Yeah. Like Eggs Benedict or something. That's nice. I was looking up Eggs Benedict, even though I know what it is. But it's a funny little snippet. It's um, it's like, oh, Eggs, Eggs Benedict is a traditional American breakfast. It's a traditional American breakfast that consists of English muffin, Canadian bacon, and French hollandaise sauce. (laughs) It was popularized in New York City. (laughs) Yeah. Which is very American. Now that you think about it. Oh, yeah. That's the beauty of America, dude. We just will take whatever we like and just add it to our culture. Yeah. Words, foods. (laughs) I got a kick of that though. Kick out of that. It is like the English language is like a, uh, it's like a, such a bastardized language. It's like a Frankenstein monster of all these different words and phrases from every fucking like corner of the world. (laughs) It's like no other language on earth is like that, but English just has to be extra. They feel like a harsh, a harsh language. Like even watching the glorious bastards, like French is such a beautiful language. And the German comes in and it's like, Oh yeah. So rough. Those Germanic languages are very rigid. I also like Russian. I like listening to Russian. I like a Russian that talks and speaks English, though. (laughs) All right, guys. uh, We'll try to find a Russian who speaks English. Bring him on the pod. Until then, we'll see you soon. See ya. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey, guys. Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick Stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.